Inflammatory bowel disease is a group of conditions where there's visible inflammation in the bowel and that usually causes tissue damage. We know that in some people there are genetic predispositions to inflammatory bowel disease. We know there are also some dietary associations. There's a lot of research interest now into the microbiome. It's a really good question because a lot of people in the community do confuse IBS which is irritable bowel syndrome, and IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease. We've talked a little bit earlier about IBD, where there's inflammation and tissue damage. In IBS, people have a lot of symptoms, and the symptoms are really very real, and they involve discomfort in the abdomen, bloating, pain, change in your bowel habits, constipation or diarrhoea, or both. Um, but when we do tests, the bowel looks fine. And that's where it's got the name of being irritable because it's giving symptoms without us seeing lesions or damage, but it's not inflamed. So the difference between IBS and IBD is really whether there is visible inflammation or whether there are symptoms of irritability or being unhappy without visible inflammation. Yes, there is a co-association between many of the autoimmune inflammatory disorders. We think that is probably related to genetic predisposition because not only can IBD run in a family and have a, a family history, but also in a family there may be more other autoimmune disorders. So there's certainly some sort of predisposition in the way people's um, immune system is put together. So in an individual patient, um, Angspong and Crohn's disease, for example, can go together. Juvenile arthritis and juvenile onset IBD can also go together. Again, though, having one doesn't guarantee you will get the other, and most people will only have one autoimmune disease. So whilst it sounds very alarming that some people will have a very high burden of disease, most people won't have a high burden and will only have one autoimmune disease. But if we're talking about statistical associations, definitely there are. What is referred to by biologics are drugs that are not made out of simple small chemicals. Biologics are made by living organisms, so often by yeasts, and they're made in huge biosystems. So they're actually more complex to make and they're large proteins. They're actually based on the antibody, um, antibodies that we make ourselves. And many of the biologics are humanized or now some of them are claiming to be fully human, but they're still sort of slightly genetically engineered. And so they act just the way our own um, antibodies act to neutralise very specific proteins in the inflammatory cascade. And they do work, but not for everybody. No single drug that we have works for everyone. So hypnosis is a really interesting aspect of therapy, not only for IBD, but also in IBS. So back to where the gut is irritable and we've got symptoms, but we don't have damage because it's actually really successful for people with IBS and other functional GI disorders. So indigestion where there's no ulcer is another treatment area for hypnotherapy. Yeah, so quality and quantity are both really important in diet. And when we talk about quality, we're talking about fresh food that we can recognize that's got fiber in it, it's got micronutrients, it's got trace elements, and it is not so calorie dense for your average person that they are putting in too many calories in one mouthful that they don't get um, a satiety signal from, which means that it doesn't make you feel full and it's kind of like that second on your lips and a lifetime on your hips problem. So foods that are really calorie dense are things like fried donuts or really rich chocolate. If you're going to have those things, just be aware they're very calorie dense. The low FODMAP diet is not an anti-inflammatory diet. The low FODMAP diet is a diet to manage symptoms, not to decrease inflammation. And in fact, being strictly low FODMAP for too long may be pro-inflammatory. I'm not aware of any evidence that a diet where the pH of your food is changed does anything. And the reason I say that is in our gut, we secrete 
litres, litres of acid every day. Our stomach secretes acid um, and the pH in the stomach after you've eaten goes really quite low. You know, so the idea that food that we put in um, when we're this big and the food we put in is this big, that that's going to change an internal pH, it, it doesn't work out mathematically and chemically. Mm-hmm.